Hey, I'm Jay Fazer from Rebel.media. I'm right now here with Jordan B. Peterson, a psychology professor from the University of Toronto, and we're going to have an hour-long conversation about a number of topics. Thank you very much for joining me, Mr. Peterson. My <laughs> pleasure. It's great to be here. Um, so in one of your videos uh, titled uh, My Message to Millennials, you described that there were two types of schools of thought. There's the truth university, and then there's the more Marxist thought. And truth university goes back to John Stuart Mill, whereas the Marxist thought, uh, well, it goes back to communist, and uh, it goes back to those types of thinkers. Um, can you briefly define, for those people who haven't watched the videos, what exactly you were talking about, and why that's important in today's political discourse? Well, th the, the distinction between those two forms of university was actually drawn by Jonathan Haidt, yes. who's a impressive psychologist, I think, uh, who works at New York University in the business school. And he has started an academy called Heterodox Academy that's been pushing for increased diversity of political viewpoint, I would say, maybe just intellectual viewpoint at universities because they've become overwhelmingly dominated by left-wing streams of thought, uh, particularly in the humanities and social sciences, and it's something that's probably accelerated in recent years. And there are um, strong and useful intellectual traditions across the political spectrum because there has to be a discussion of such things, but the universities are in danger of degenerating into uh, what I would consider a strident single voice. So one of the things that Haidt has done is rank order universities according to their perceived commitment to either the ideals of so-called social justice or the ideals of more classic modernist ideals of objectivity and and fact and truth and science and 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 the development of the individual the idea as well that the purpose of education is to strengthen the ideal of the individual rather than to recreate society in some utopian vision the the social justice types on on the side of um, well on the side of the social justice stance believe that the primary goal of institutions like the university is to reshape society in their in the image of their specified ideology and Haidt regards that as at least something that should be subject to debate and mm -hmm. I also believe that so uh, so it's mostly in the humanities and social sciences that we do see these problems. Are these problems starting to creep into more natural sciences and engineering as well? Well, I wouldn't say that they're creeping into engineering. Um, that's harder. In the sciences, I, I think the sciences are more vulnerable, especially on the biological end, because and and in 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 domains that are sort of a mix of engineering and science. And I would put psychiatry in that domain. It's more human engineering. Yeah. Um, the bio biological domains and the and the psychiatric domains are, I think, more susceptible to that, the influx of such views. Although I have had people write me, who were also upset because at their at their at in the curriculum of their of their children's schools, there were attempts being made to put a social justice module into the physics programs, decrying the fact that. Mm -hmm. Physics is dominated essentially by white males and, and making the assumption that the field is essentially corrupt because of that, roughly speaking. And so you can introduce an ideological dimension into any, into the discussion of any uh, discipline. And you can especially do that if you don't believe that there are any privileged methodologies, let's say. I mean, scientists, of course, believe that the methodology of science is privileged in some sense because of its capacity to extract out useful objective truths and the, at least the practical power of that's demonstrated everywhere around us right I mean mm -hmm. it's a, the, a huge part of the reason we have such a high standard of living of course is because of the application of scientific methods to our understanding of the world um, so how does how does this go from academia to um, to the actual thoughts of, of, of students, and how does it go from there to actual political upheaval? Well, there's, there's many disciplines, and I would say the, the, the ethnic studies, women's studies uh, disciplines, I think they're pseudo-disciplines, are particularly, uh, res particularly responsible for such things. Their, their stated objective is to produce 
radical activists whose goal is to demolish what they describe as the patriarchy, which is a very ill-defined concept. Uh, reminds me very much of Carl Jung's idea of the animus. Carl Jung believed that men were represented in the unconscious of females as a group, essentially. Mm -hmm. You might think about it as a, a male dominance hierarchy. That's one way of thinking about it. And, of course, the male hierarchy has tyrannical elements as well as beneficial elements. The beneficial elements are manifest in what society bequeaths to us as, uh, as we enter the world. The fact that we have a functional infrastructure and functioning social institutions and conventions and laws and all of those things. And the tyrannical aspect is manifested in the fact that if you're going to live together with other people in an organized society, the, that society is going to be based on <coughs> uh, the construction of a certain kind of norm of behavior to which everyone is going to be somewhat unfavorably compared because you, you can't have a, a, a you can't have social harmony without each individual or perhaps even each group giving up a certain amount of their freedom in order to participate in the in the normative structures and so any social organization has this beneficial security producing element and a tyrannical element and the radical ideologues only concentrate on the tyrannical element and forget, I, I think their primary sin as far as I'm concerned is ingratitude especially in the West because we have an incredibly highly functioning social, economic and political system it produces inequality but every system produces inequality That's, that seems to be built into the nature of creative production, the, the production of inequality and it, it's, a, it's definitely a major challenge for every society because the the fruits of uh, the fruits of the fruits of every form of labor tend to aggregate in the hands of a tiny minority of people. And Vilfred Perito figured that out back in the late 1900s, late 1800s. It looks a bit like a natural law. It's like what happens when you play Monopoly. Every time you play a Monopoly game, one person ends up with all the money. And you play another Monopoly game, the same thing happens, it's a different person, but the same thing always happens. Anyways, these more ideologically motivated uh, disciplines lay, the, lay human suffering at, at, at the feet of the patriarchy. And it's an extraordinarily foolish and unidimensional view. There's lots of sources of suffering. Um, individual corruption and malevolence and, and fragility is a, is a source that's completely independent from, from broader society. The depredations of the natural world, the fact that we're prone to illness and, and decay and, 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 and that we're mortal, that's all built into the structure of existence. You can't lay that at the feet of this hypothetical patriarchal entity. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's absurd. But it's a game that anyone can learn to play and, and there's a certain kind of moral justification that goes along with it too because it, once you've safely identified the perpetrators and those would be the people who hypothetically are and, and who are hypothetically and uniquely characterized by privilege you know where the bad people are and you're on the side of the good people with no effort whatsoever and it's extraordinarily dangerous because to localize all the evil, say, that characterizes human beings in a group to which you do not belong is... there's hardly anything that's more dangerous than that. So that's why we're seeing a lot of radical activists in Black Lives Matter or feminist groups is because they paint the enemy as being either white people for Black Lives Matter activists or feminists as men, when mm -hmm. really the world is much more complicated than that. And yet well, there's a tyrannical ele element well, for everything. Well, like the, uh, the, idea that, the idea that women have been oppressed across history by men is a foolish idea. It's, it's not precisely because it's not true. I mean, men and women oppress each other all the time. Women oppress men just as much as men oppress women. <laughs> I mean, men, women are, for example, much more choosy when it comes to the selection of partners than men are. So men are constantly subject to a never-ending stream of rejection from women. And I'm not blaming women, it's no bloody wonder they do that. A sex comes for them at a much higher cost. They should be precisely as picky as they are. And mm -hmm. it's actually been one of the evolutionary factors. Human female sexual choosiness has been one of the prime 
selection factors that have resulted in the construction of, of modern human beings so I'm not decrying that but the idea that the oppression is unidimensional is completely insane and it also of course never takes into account the fact at all that uh, the, the activities of men across time have also been of inestimable benefit to women you know Camille Peglia <laughs> she famously said once I'll, I'll certainly get in trouble for re recording this. That if if, you want, if there were no it. no, it's okay. If there were no men, women would still live in mud huts. You know, and it's not one of the things that made her particularly popular. But you know, men men have a certain facility for the manipulation of gadgets, and yeah. there's certainly their 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 intellectual interests uh, will tilt in that direction. P men are like extraordinarily tool extraordinary tool users and tool builders. And the idea that all men have done throughout history is oppress women, or the idea that women didn't get their chance to do what men did because men were oppressing mm. them is insane. I mean, if you go back into the late 1800s, before 1895, for example, the typical Westerner lived on less than a dollar a day, which is basically poverty level uh, subsistence, the mm. sort of poverty level subsistence that now characterizes, uh, uh, still characterizes a significant proportion of the third world but when you're living on a dollar a day man you don't have to be oppressed by anyone to be oppressed right let life itself is the oppressive agent you're struggling to get by you're living at subsistence and women didn't have uh, uh, reliable birth control and so they apart from the incredible economic hardship that characterized that sort of lifestyle was the necessity of generally getting married very young having few other options uh, being pregnant or breastfeeding for much of your youth and and being a grandmother early if you weren't dead and you probably were mm -hmm. and then being old by the time you were in your 40s you don't need to add the oppression of men to that to make it pretty damn miserable and people have been working collectively and cooperatively to try to lift everyone out of that pool of misery and with substantial success you know I mean this is the other thing that really strikes me as uh, what would be unforgivable about the ingratitude of the radical activists on the left is you know at the moment we're lifting collectively we're lifting about 250,000 people a day out of abject poverty across the world and we're hooking about 300,000 people a day to the electrical power grid where the UN had set as a as a target the 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 reduction of abject poverty across the world by 50% from by 2015 that was their millennial goal yeah. from 2000 and they hit that we hit that in 2013 right. i mean this 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 capitalist system that's being decried as oppressive by everyone on the radical left is lifting people out of poverty at a rate that's absolutely unparalleled in human history so now at the same time i must say at the same time the, the that system also results in in the production of fairly vast inequalities but the thing about that is, is there's never been a system set up in the history of the world where such inequality wasn't the norm it's more like a natural law there's there's even a branch of physics called econophysics it's a hybrid of e economics and, and physics you can look it up if you want that models the the distribution of money in populations as a consequence of random trading the consequence generally is is that even if money is distributed equally it takes virtually no time in any trading game for a tiny minority to have all of the money again and most people to have none it's a monopoly game that's and so the, the the thing is we don't know what to do about that like it's a bad idea to have two-thirds of the population stack up at zero it, it breeds revolution even if you're a, a, a republican say a conservative someone who leans mm -hmm. to the right you have every reason to be wary of two of levels of inequality that become too high because it destabilizes the entire society we know this as, as inequality increases say in any given geographic uh, locale the ma male crime rate particularly the murder rate climbs uh, uh, precipitously and it's the best known predictor of male criminality is, is poverty. Inequali inequality. Inequality. inequality no no not, not poverty. poverty not poverty not poverty, not poverty. Not poverty. If you go to places where everyone's poor, there's no male violence. And if you go to places where everyone's rich, there's no male violence. But if you go places where 
a substantial number of poor and a, are poor and yeah. a minority of people are rich the males you could say that the males males can be temperamentally aggressive right up to a greater or lesser degree so then you might imagine that as your temperamental proclivity for aggression increases the degree of inequality that will trigger you gets less and less mm -hmm. so as inequality rises the most aggressive males who, who who are doing without get violent first and then the inequality increases more let's say as it increases more then the slightly less aggressive males become aggressive and then as it rises more so you, it, there's yeah. an interaction between temperament well that there makes sense in a darwinian sense because you males are competitive naturally competitive and yeah you know if you're if you're not yeah they're looking well for off. status yeah and you probably act violent yeah well the <laughs> thing is that's well you do you do because or the at, least, thing, at least more aggressive. well the thing is turning yeah. to crime crime is a high risk high return strategy yeah so for example there is a good sociological study done of uh drug dealing gang in chicago 10 years ago 15 years ago by a sociology student who got access to this drug gang he went out to interview some some gang members uh -huh. and told them he was writing a book and they sort of took him under his their wing so to speak and so he got privileged access to their operations and and the gang dispersed because the projects in which it was operating were torn down but the uh, leader of the gang handed over his books his his financial books to the sociologist after the gang collapsed and but what they basically found was that <clears throat> the typical street level drug vendor made less than minimum wage and most of them by the way had other jobs as well which was quite interesting because it meant that the the drug dealers were actually among the more entrepreneurial and hard working members of the community they actually had two jobs right so but the the low level operatives the street operatives were making less than minimum wage and so you might say well why did they even bother and the answer was well there was a tiny minority of people who controlled the drug trade who were making a tremendous amount of money and the guys at the bottom were willing to play the lottery to see if they could move up the ladder to occupy those more privileged positions and yeah. the same sort of thing has been, and and that the reason they want to occupy those more privileged positions particularly when they're young is because males who occupy positions of power are much more attractive to women so um uh there's a famous canadian psychologist team of canadian psychologists margo wilson and uh Martin Daly, who worked at, at uh, out at, at Hamilton, um, at McMaster, Canada's most outstanding evolutionary psychologists, did a study at one point showing that, uh, first of all, they established the relationship between inequality and, and male aggression. The correlation is like 0.8. It's off the charts, man. It's like it's 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 one of the, maybe it might be the most powerful relationship between two hypothetically independent variables that, that psychologists or social scientists have ever discovered. It's off the charts. So inequality fosters male-on-male -male violence, and it's because of competition for scarce resources, and it's driven by sexual selection pressures, r roughly speaking. Yes. Um, one of the things that Daly and Wilson did, and I believe this was in Chicago as well, they did an, an ethnological, anthropological study of the consequence of... Uh, interracial murder in the gang setting in Chicago so basically what would happen is two gangs were were vying for territorial dominance let's say mm -hmm. and there was some kind of violent exchange so let's call it a fight well the thing is if you're in one gang and I'm in another <clears throat> and we engage in a violent altercation one of us perhaps might die but who's gonna die is a toss-up right so that means that I can plead self-defense if I'm involved in that altercation well, and so generally what happened was that the plea was self-defense, the, the charge was plea bargained down to involuntary manslaughter, or to manslaughter, the person was thrown in jail for, or sentenced for perhaps three years and served something like 18 months, mm -hmm. and then when they re-entered the fray, when, when they were back out on the streets, their credibility had, had increased substantially, and so had their probability of success. Mm -hmm. So, so, <clears throat> well, so, that's all to say that the left's concern with inequality is a justifiable concern. The problem is we don't know what to do with it. We don't know what to do about it. It's, it, it's very difficult to shovel money and other resources, because it isn't only money that this sort of process applies to. It's very difficult to shovel resources from the, the pile at the top down to the many at the bottom who are hovering around zero. Yeah. So uh, it's something that has to be taken into account because 
well, first, it's not good for everybody to be stacking up at zero, and second, it destabilizes the society itself. Uh -huh. So, But that doesn't mean we know what to do about it. That's the critical thing. It also doesn't mean that the reason that the people at the top have most of the resources, regardless of what those resources are, it, it doesn't mean that the reason they have them is because they're exploiting the people at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Now, there is an element of exploitation in, er in any complex productive system, always because they don't operate completely fairly, right? So yeah, but we know in, in Western society that um, trait conscientiousness, for example, is a very good predictor of long-term economic success. So we do know that despite the fact that this is actually against the speech codes of many universities now, hard work actually matters. <laughs> it's much more likely to make you successful. And intelligence yeah. matters as well. And people know this. I mean, th it's not like everyone who's poor is unintelligent. That's not true, because there's many reasons for poverty, in in innumerable reasons for poverty. Ill health, drug and alcohol abuse, bad luck, familial pathology. Um, that's just a handful. Um, but if you're not gifted, say, with, with uh, spectacular levels of intelligence, it's much more difficult for you to find a complex job mm -hmm. in which you can thrive and generate the income that would be um, uh, in keeping with that. And this is a problem that neither the right nor the left wants to address. Look, 8% of the population, something like that, have, a, have intelligence levels that are low enough so that it's illegal to, to induct them into the US military. If you think about that, that's one person in 15, roughly speaking. Mm -hmm. It's actually more than that, it's about one person in 12. The Ameri American military, who's desperate for bodies, right? We got to get that right. They're absolutely desperate for bodies. They never get enough people into the military. And during peacetime, they're attempting to use the military constantly as a way of moving people from the bottom of the economic pyramid, say, up at least into the lower middle class. Yeah. They decided 20 years ago, maybe more, that there wasn't anything that anyone with an IQ of under 83, if I remember correctly, could do in the military that wasn't counterproductive. You know, and so the, the right-wingers basically think that there's a job out there for everyone who will work hard enough, and the left-wingers think, well, you can just train everybody because we're all the same. And like, both those things are really wrong. Yeah. So it's a huge problem, but no one will address it. It's one of those things you just do not get to talk well, about. Well, there are a lot of taboos in <coughs> science and, and the popular culture. Obviously, one of the taboos are intelligence in regards to race and um, gender as well. Um, well, intelligence, intelligence, period. You know, the idea yeah. that, it, that intelligence exists and that it matters, but I mean, everyone obviously knows that that's the case. And yeah. So we select students for universities roughly on the basis of their intelligence. And, and it's a good thing because there's not any utility in putting someone in a position where they're very much likely to fail. Well, there are unless you want them to fail. Well, there are millions of students right now that are going through universities, and I think over the years, universities have dropped their bars. Yes. <laughs> <coughs> the acceptance rate has gone up, but the intelligence has, why not? Has well, it, it, it's a complicated one because there is some evidence. Uh, they call it the Flynn effect. Yeah, that, the Flynn effect. Yeah, that, that population that well. levels of intelligence well, are well, increasing. Well, overall, the population of levels yeah. of intelligence would go up, but, but so for example, in relation to... Well, at places like sense. Harvard, for example, yeah. um, the average IQ of Harvard students is way higher than it was 50 years ago. Because the Ivy League schools for the longest time were finishing schools for, for rich kids, yeah. you know, and so they weren't necessarily, they would be on average more intelligent than people just selected from the, randomly from the general population, but they weren't certainly necessarily, uh, uh, what would you call, uh, they weren't selected for their intellectual prowess, they are now, and so the average IQ at a place like Harvard is like above 135, mm -hmm. which is, uh, you know, a pretty small proportion of the population. So, anyways, you know, back to, back to inequality. There are many reasons mm -hmm. for inequality, and to lay it at the feet of the patriarchy is, is absurd beyond belief. Unidimensional, it's a trick, it's a game that anybody can learn how to play in a week, which is another thing that makes it very intellectually, yeah. uh, um, what would you call, uh, well, reprehensible is the right term. Well, there's a tyrannical element with every single system of governance, and there's also a, ble a benevolent yeah, well, and, and the balance of that yeah. varies. And hopefully you're fortunate enough to live in a society where the benevolent element outweighs the tyrannical element. And I think that if that wasn't characteristic of Western societies, then they wouldn't be societies that attract immigrants. And they are. So that yeah. speaks for itself. 
So what we have to say <coughs> to the people who've accepted the Marxist school of thought that they should only look at the tyrannical element and only fight against those. Um, and well, so I, uh, what, okay. what is actually the solution to, let's say, solving the state that young people are in right now, where we have this sort of victim mentality and we have this sort of, I, we have people who are indoctrinated into identity politics. Well, you know, there, there might not even be necessarily something wrong, broadly speaking, with conceptualizing yourself as a victim, but you have to do it properly. It's like, and you do that in part by recognizing that suffering is built into the fabric of human existence, and so you are vulnerable and you will die. And you can, you know, that's harsh, that's tragic, I would say. Mm -hmm. and, and tragedy is built into, into being. And so to the degree that you partake in that tragedy, you could consider yourself, although I think it's the wrong way of conceptualizing it, you could consider yourself as a victim among the universality of victimhood. I, I think that's not a helpful way of looking at it because it leads to despair. But to think of yourself as a particular victim or to think of yourself as a, a victim among the privileged, I think that gets dangerous extraordinarily rapidly. Mm. It also overestimates the degree to which the privileged, so to speak, are protected from the tragedy of existence. Like, money has its utility, uh, primarily as a tool for doing things, really. You know, you can think about it as a, as a means for obtaining luxury items, but that gets dull pretty quickly for most people that have any sense. It's like. I've been to the houses of very wealthy people, and some of them are quite remarkable, but most of the, because they're creative people. But most of the time, I remember going to a gated community, for example, in California, and it was a huge house. It was probably 10,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. But it was no different than a 2,000 square foot house. It was just bigger. Like the stoves were bigger, the fridge was bigger, the wine cellar was bigger, the rooms were bigger. Who cares? It's more to take care of. It's not helpful for anything unless you're using it for a creative purpose. And you know, they also lived in a gated community, and you can hardly imagine anything duller than that. You know, like, there's nothing there, there's no bars, there's no nightlife, there's no nightclubs, there's no, there's no corner stores, there's no churches, there's nowhere for people to hang out, there's not even any sidewalks. Mm -hmm. So, so who, who cares? And we know that the relationship between income and, I'll call it happiness, it's, it's a pathetic measure really, but we could say well-being or life quality. I've heard, that, I've heard that most people are just all right with around $70,000. Well, you're all right and with... anything more than that is just excessive. Well, the, you're all, your money has done as much for you as it can do by the time you can pay your bills. Yeah. That's, but think about it. This is the reason, especially in a place like North America. It's like, well, define wealth. All right, that's easy. Heat in the winter. Mm -hmm. Air conditioning in the summer. Running water, right? Reliable shelter and the provision of high quality food. Once you've got those, and, and then we could add to that, access to all the world's information. Okay, everyone has that virtually, unless you've fallen right out of society. Mm -hmm. You know, those are the things that, that, that stave off, maybe we could add reasonable access to healthcare to that. Although for most people, especially if they're young and healthy, that's irrelevant. But it, once you have those first six things, indoor plumbing, for example, you're, you're already overwhelmingly rich by, by historical and even worldwide standards. You're already in the top one-tenth of one percent of all the human beings that have ever lived. And incremental movement past that just doesn't make that much difference, you know. So maybe you have a ten-year-old uh, Hyundai Sonata. I have one of those. It's like, well, I could have a, um, a McLaren. But the incremental difference when we're stuck in a traffic jam is zero. So, so, well, so the, 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 the radical leftists underestimate, overestimate the utility of wealth in relationship to its capacity to solve the fundamental problems that mm. beset human beings. So rich people get cancer. Rich people get divorced. Rich people get estranged from their children. They develop drug and alcohol problems. Like, they're, they're, they're sued constantly for what they're doing. They're engaged in legal battles, and their lives tend to be extraordinarily complex because it's not easy to handle money. It disappears, man. If you don't keep an eye on it, if you're not watching it and, and monitoring it and earning it, generally speaking, it disappears. And that most family fortunes disappear in three generations. Mm -hmm. And most Fortune 500 companies only last 30 years. 
-hmm. And there is a 1%, but it churns, you know. The, the 1% 10 years ago, they're not the same people that are the 1% now. Some of them are, obviously, but there's quite a bit of turnover. Well, I've always found it strange that people, the left has this sort of fixation for the 1% when in reality, I mean, if you sell your house, in, if you live in a house in San Francisco and you sell it, you're a millionaire. Yes, you're, yes. You're part of the 1%. Yes. But obviously, you're just, a, you're just a former homeowner. And like, what I'm trying to say is that over time, you know, well, the, well, that, well, the other thing, too, that people don't understand very well, because they don't look into it at all, is that most of the people who are in the 1% are old. So that, what do you want to be? You want to be young and poor, old and rich. Yeah. You know, like what happens is if you're lucky as you move through life, you trade your youth for security, yeah. roughly speaking. But, you know, you're 75 and you have $5 million. Well, yeah, okay. You're 75. And, of course, the, the amount of wealth people have accumulates as they get older. Well, you know, if, they, if the person is fortunate and, and sensible, because they save up their money and they've had much more time to work. And so, so a huge, most of these things are multivariate problems, right? Why is there a 1%? Well, because the patriarchy is oppressive. It's like, yeah, okay, that accounts for 5% of the variance or 10% of the variance if you want to really, like, push your argument. But then all sorts of other things kick in. Health is a good one, um, and intellectual power and conscientiousness and, and good luck and social network and, and, well, and timing is a huge part of it, and a lot of that's just random. Yeah. There's endless numbers of contributors to wealth disparity, not the oppression of the patriarchy. Jesus, you know, people who think that should be embarrassed at their stupidity. And the reason I'm saying that is because you don't really start talking that way till you've been educated a little bit. But to, to, to turn everything into a univariate problem, like a one variable problem, is it's the mind, it's the, it's the hallmark of a tremendously ignorant and weak mind. Because things are complicated. And mm. so are the solutions. Man, things are complicated enough, but the solutions are even worse. Well, it, it's unfortunate because most people go to university, they just go for the four year route and they get their undergraduate degree. And then if you go into the whole social sciences or humanities, I mean, I, I've been in, I'm a political science student, and I've been through, but I've been through economics classes, I've been through statistics classes, and so philosophy classes. And the general consensus, at least in regards to topics like this, is that the West is bad, mm -hmm. that we live in a patriarchy, mm -hmm. that white people have been oppressive, have oppressed black people. Mm -hmm. And that reverberates, and if, if you're not, like if you're not more educated, you go out of university, and that's how you—that's mm -hmm. how you think for almost the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. You think that the world is against you if you're if you're a black person. If you're a black female, well, <laughs> the world's against you doubly. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, black females actually tend to do better than black males if you look at the if you look at the social if you look at the graduate if you look at the graduation. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so you know, but but look, I mean, the thing about all those ideas is that they're true. They're just not completely true. Like, of course the West is oppressive. Yes, right. But compared to what, exactly? Like, who are you comparing it to? Well, some hypothetical utopia. Yes, definitely, it falls short. How about other societies that have actually existed? Well, then, it starts to look pretty good, because at least everyone isn't dead, yeah. which is really the, the, the end story for most civilizations, right? They're, they're tyrannical beyond comprehension instead of being more tyrannical than they should be. Now, that's a pretty dismal basis of comparison, and I, I don't think people like that sort of comparison either, because it forces them to confront the fact that tragedy is built into the structure of existence instead of being able to lay it conveniently, especially at the feet of people who hypothetically have more than you do. Yeah. So, and, I mean, there, there, there's always conflict between racial groups and ethnic groups, constantly. But, but even the discussion of slavery is generally pretty damn boneheaded, because you don't have to go back very far in history till you find that the majority of people, regardless of their ethnicity or race, were essentially enslaved. I mean, in, mm. in Russia, for example, in the late, it wasn't until the very late 1800s that the serfs were emancipated, and they were, you know, you, it isn't obvious that they were treated as dismally, dismally as the slaves in the U.S., but Christ, they were sold as property, they were part of estates, they were extraordinarily poor, they labored for their for their noble, essentially, it was still a medieval society. Mm. So, that the history of humanity is the history of, of oppression, that's for sure, and exploitation, definitely, and conflict between racial and ethnic groups, for sure. But, 
That isn't the entire story. We've also been trying hard to lift ourselves out of the muck, and we have at least produced a set of standards. And I would say this this particularly characterizes the West. We've produced a set of standards that at least um, requires us on moral grounds to transcend those 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 uh, those states of natural being, because they are states of natural being. Slavery is the norm, not the exception. Mm. So, well. Uh, so the University of Toronto has a free speech club, and they've. Uh, I asked them to send me a bunch of questions, yeah. and so I'm going to read out some of these questions okay. to you. Um, so I guess the first question comes from Riley A. Griffin. The notion of truth, both moral and scientific, is being attacked, disregarded, and defiled by malignant ideologies. As a Canadian and Westerner, I view rational debate as the cornerstone of our democratic institutions. However, it seems as though rational debate regarding scientific and moral truth is increasingly difficult. Um, how can we have effective truth-seeking discussions with someone who endorses postmodernist relativism? A discussion no. even possible? No, not really, because the, the postmodernists don't believe in dialogue. They believe that the idea that groups of people with different intrinsic interests, and that stems more from the rooting in Marxism, um, the idea that they can engage in dialogue and come to a mutually affirming consensus, let's say, because that's really what you do if you solve a complex yeah. problem. They believe that that's, that's, a, that's a value that's intrinsic to the patriarchy itself. And so even to admit, even to engage in that as a process is seen as something that merely upholds the, the, the structural pathology that characterizes the patriarchy. So no, mm. it's generally it's not possible because Postmodernists don't believe in dialogue. Also, well, we can't have a conver we can't have conversations with these people who think this way. But th so, what are you supposed to do exactly? Uh, shut up. Fundamentally, I mean, well, that's the demand on campus. I mean, for example, that's, I'm, that's I'm, what they're telling us. But how how do we respond back to that? Just just are we supposed to respond back and hope that there's an element of? Well, I think you can always you can always set up discussions among yourself. Yeah, you know, I mean. Postmodernists don't necessarily have to represent postmodern ideas. You can always read the books that yourself, and mm. you can set up debates where, and you know, a te and a, in a formal debate, it isn't necessarily the case that you have to uh, firmly believe the side of the argument that you're that you're taking or that you're presenting. I mean, one of the hallmarks of a well-trained mind is that you can formulate an argument on both sides of an issue. And, and that's really what thinking is, right? Thinking is an internal debate. Yeah. That's what it is. And so you can externalize that. So I would say, generally speaking, there's no point in talking to people who won't listen. That, and listening isn't the same as agreeing. You know, if, if you're having a productive discussion with someone, then first of all, they do see things differently than you do, because otherwise, why bother having a discussion? That's only self-affirmation. If they do see things differently than you, and you have a productive debate, then you both walk away changed and enriched in principle. Of course, that's the that's a presupposition of the phallogocentric patriarchy. That, but I happen to believe that it's the case because it's not only that presupposition; it's also the basis for human communication. Mm -hmm. The alternative to communication that's easy: it's capitulation or or war. Those are the options. Mm -hmm. So you either talk or you capitulate. Or you fight. That's it. Those are the options. So, we, so I suppose we should hope that, fundamentally speaking, people, there's an element even in the postmodernists that would um, be susceptible to. Well, it's to hard to say because, it it, well, it depends on what people are up to. You know, like th there are no shortage of people who think they would like to fight. For well, first of all, there's no shortage of people who would like their opponents to capitulate. Now you can be sure of that. But, but we'll leave them aside, there's also a strong sub-element of the population at any given time who imagine they would like to fight. And there, there are often people who are resentful enough because of their feelings of, let's say, victimization and exclusion. They're resentful enough so that they're willing to throw everything up in the air and let it fall where, they, where it will. Mm -hmm. Now, the, often the problem with people like that is they have a very romanticized notion of exactly what constitutes revolution. They don't, they don't, they don't they don't know what they're up to exactly, or maybe they refuse to see what they're up to. You no, know, you don't have to read very much about the Russian Revolution or the French Revolution, for that matter, to see just how terribly things go, and how quickly they go there, it, and 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 to 
teach yourself that maybe going there is, unless the situation is truly dire, which it is by no means truly dire in the West, unless the situation is truly dire, revolution, well, the first thing revolution does is eat the children of the revolutionaries, that's for sure. If you foment a revolution, the probability that even if you win, that you'll live 20 years after the revolution is basically zero, because mm -hmm. the people, the ideological revolutionaries call out of the corners are no one's friend, including the ideological revolutionaries, so a lot of it's tremendous naivety, mm -hmm. and, and the inability to put the current situation in the world in any kind of historical context. You know, these people on campuses who consider themselves either victims or spokespeople for the, vic for the victimized are, pr are privileged beyond comprehension. They're not as privileged as some tiny percentage of more privileged people, but they're tremendously privileged when compared to, say, the, the global population norm. Mm -hmm. You don't get to be a student at a university campus and consider yourself part of the oppressed. It, yeah. You're not. You know, you can, you can calculate a population within which you're comparatively oppressed. Yeah. But if you open the, the category and say, okay, by the standards of people living in the world today, where am I on the economic distribution? It's like, well, you're way up in the top one-tenth of one percent or, or some, well, substantially higher than that. You're just a baby dominator if you're a university student. You're still a dominator. So. All right. Um, I'm just going to ask the next question. Yeah. Um, this one's from John Ballantyne. What should we do to combat the spread of radical Islamic movements that utilize the victimhood mentality and the freedom of speech directly upon communities they reside in, in Canada and the West, even in integrated and moderate Muslim communities? Well, the first thing I would say about that is learn everything you possibly can about Islam so that you know what the hell you're talking yeah. about. Right, and you might want to do the same thing with regards to Christianity and Judaism too. I mean, I know it's a lot to demand, but I don't think there's any option. It's not that easy to learn about Islam either. I've been trying to do it for the last three years or so, you know, with, with a fair bit of diligence, and I still don't feel that I'm in a position to speak about it with any real authority. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not part of my culture, and so that's, that, that's a barrier right away. Mm -hmm. So, you, the first rule is learn learn enough so you know what you're talking about. And that's hard, and th these are deep, fundamentally deep issues, right? Because these are, you know, we, in the West, roughly speaking, we have the interactions between three, increasing interactions between three fundamental religious systems, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. They're all very complex systems in their own right. And how they are going to merge, no, it's anyone's guess, so, but in the meantime, you should be on the lookout for, for any moves by governments or other organizations that limit what you're allowed to say, either implicitly or explicitly. It's a big mistake. So like it's, with Motion 103 then? Well, I, I, I think that M103 was ill-advised in, in a variety of ways. I, I don't think, I think it had exactly the opposite effect that it was intended to have. The fact that it included the word Islamophobia, which I regard as a reprehensible word. There, I don't like the word because Phobia actually has a technical, medical slash psychological meaning, mm. and that word was appropriated for ideological usage and then applied to um, any conflict, ideological or emotional, between different identity groups, say. So it's a crooked word, and so whenever it shows up, any of that, that phobia language, whenever that shows up, I'm immediately skeptical of the intent of, the, of, the, of those who are using the word, because it's a, it's a it's a, it, it, it has manipulation built into its structure. So, now, you know, you could say, well, the, the M103, and this is what the Conservatives suggested, we, we, could, we could pass a motion decrying um, arbitrary discrimination. Fine, arbitrary discrimination is in no one's best interest. But the thing is that there's already protection against that sort of thing built very solidly into Canadian law, so mm -hmm. it isn't clear that it's necessary to include Islamophobia in there, it's like, nope, I don't trust it right away, I don't trust it, because it's not a valid, it's not a, it's not a word with integrity, that's why. It's ill-defined, it isn't obvious what those who are using it mean, and words have meanings, it's as simple as that, you have to get your, you, you have to be very, very careful with the words that you use, especially when you're operating at the level of government, it's not policy, but it's a precursor to policy. 
So an, an Ikra Khalid, she was presented with, with a, a compromise solution by the Conservatives and rejected it. So why? Well, she insisted upon the inclusion of the word Islamophobia. It's okay, well, as far as I'm concerned, that's a bad idea. All right, uh, I'll just read the last question. All right. Um, so this is from Yusuf Zuskin. On his recent appearance on Joe Rogan Experience, Neil deGrasse Tyson voiced his frustration at his inability to convince ideologues they're wrong, even after asking what kind of evidence they would need to accept that they're wrong, and then giving them that exact evidence. I would love to hear Peterson's thoughts on this issue, and if he has come across any effective strategies to persuade people to accept arguments that mm -hmm. demonstrate hypocrisy. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, look, the only thing, the only answer I have to that is that you cannot talk to people who will not engage in a discussion. See, one of the things Carl Rogers sorted out, he was a clinician, was he tried to understand what the preconditions were for an effective therapeutic relationship. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the preconditions was that the person who was coming to engage in the relationship, so the client, had to be willing to discuss the fact that there was a problem. Right, so like if you and I are having a discussion, like we are now, the proper attitude to bring to the discussion is the, the presupposition that the other person might know something that would be important for you to know, which means you don't know everything yet. And if you're lucky, you can talk to the other person carefully, and they'll tell you something you don't know. And that's a great gift, because then you walk away knowing something that you didn't know. Now, the price you pay for that is that sometimes, almost always, if you learn anything of significance, you have to question something that you already held as an absolute. And so, you, you pay the price of partial disintegration for the acquisition of a new unit of information. So there's cur there, there has to be courage in, in a real dialogue, mm -hmm. and humility in a real dialogue. If you're talking to someone who's ideologically possessed, all they're trying to do is convince you that they're right. And you can tell when you're talking to someone like that, because if you pay attention, you'll see that you're not there. They could be talking to anyone. You're just, you're just a placeholder for those who do not agree. There's no individual conversation at all. There's no, there's no admission that we jointly face a problem. You know, like I could sit down and have with people from all ideological positions and say, well, let's have a discussion about inequality. Like, there's a problem. Inequality is a problem. Exactly what sort of problem? We could try to specify what a set of hypothetical solutions might look like. We could try to specify. Let's see if we can advance towards clarity with regards to formulating the problem and, and start to generate some potential solutions. Knowing full well that the solutions we generate are unlikely to produce the results that we would intend for them to produce if we implemented them, mm -hmm. right? Because that's also an, an acceptance of, of ignorance. But if you're speaking to someone who's ideologically possessed, they already know the answers. They know the problem, and they know the answers. Well, why have the discussion? There's, there's no point in discussing it. And so, what you do in that situation, which is really what the question was, is you, you exist by example. That's all you've got. You have to embody a better way of, of being, so that people who encounter you ca have their own, have the, uh, what, would, what would you say, call into question the negative consequences of their own rigidity. And that's what you've got. You know, if people meet as equals in a conversation, they both enter it knowing they don't know everything. But if they meet on an ideological battleground, that isn't what's happening at all. And so, there's this old saying in the New Testament, which is a very harsh saying, which is, don't cast pearls before swine. It's really a rough saying. It's certainly not something you would regard as merciful. But what it means is, if you're talking, honestly, you're actually trying to have a conversation, and the person isn't listening, you should shut up. Because you aren't who they think you are, and you're not where you think you are. You're somewhere else. And you need to sort out exactly where you are, and, and continue the conversation in that vein. If there's no real communication occurring, that's not going to happen.
so <laughs> the purpose of this interview was actually to talk about young people where we talked about a whole slew of things and I actually enjoyed every se I actually enjoyed every second of it um, I suppose I'll, I'll get back to the uh, to the the initial purpose was talk about young people yeah. now educate they need to educate obviously themselves. I'm a young yeah. yeah obviously I'm a young person yeah and obviously um, I've been through the heat of it and I've seen what university campuses do to people who have even remotely dissenting ideas. Um, and I, I understand exactly the type of thought process. Well, not, not yeah, to the fullest yeah. extent I can. Yeah. But um, I, I, I understand where the Marxist school of thought is coming from, and I understand where the John Mill uh, school of thought is coming from as well. So who are the thinkers that young people should look towards? And more importantly, what are the type of personalities and attitudes young people should take so they, they could individually benefit the world and, and well, see the, the world well, in the positive the purpose, the purpose of a liberal education, let's say, and so that would be an, ed, an education that's grounded in the humanities and, yeah. and to a lesser degree in the social sciences. And I'll talk about that first, because if you go into the sciences or into the, into the professional schools, your goal is established, right? You're, you're trying to make a career in, in those areas with the liberal with the, with the liberal education in the humanities, the goal is more amorphous because there's no specified outcome. So then the question is, well, what are you, what is it that you should be trying to attain? And what you are trying to attain in a program like that is mastery of the world. And that means that you need to know how things work, as many things as you can possibly figure out, and you read as widely as you possibly can. Now the universities are supposed to be there to help you figure out what to read, uh, uh, a job which I'm afraid they're falling down on. But there is a corpus of, there is a corpus of, of, of books that are universally regarded within the Western intellectual tradition as great. That's a good place to start. Generally speaking, people who have a reputation, an international reputation, generally speaking, have something to say. Read everything you can get your hands on. I put a reading list up on my website, of books that were particularly influential to me. But, but equally importantly, you need to learn to write and speak. And one of the things that isn't taught to students at universities, although I just cannot figure out why, is why you should learn that. And that, like, you write an essay to learn to think. You write an essay to learn to formulate your arguments so that you have firm ground to stand on when you're engaged in the kind of negotiation that you're going to be engaging in throughout your life. If you're capable of formulating arguments carefully and in an articulate manner, you are absolutely unstoppable. It's as simple as that. And so what you learn by, by mastering the humanities is you, you accrue power and, 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 not, and hopefully beneficial power, beneficial for you, but also beneficial for the people around you, right? Because you become a mouthpiece of civilization. And, and there is such a thing as civilization. It's, it's cooperative and competitive endeavor devoted towards the highest good. And that exists, and it's exciting to take part in. And you can tell when you're taking part in it because it's deeply meaningful. And the goal for young people is to turn themselves into someone, to, for each person to turn themselves into a person who stands up straight and who pays attention, and who can think, and who can speak, and, and who can act in relationship to the, to the highest good they can conceive of. And that, I believe that that's a way of being that's noble enough, so that if it's inactive, it also takes the sting out of the tragedy of life. You think, well, there's something noble about bearing up under a heavy load. And human beings have a heavy load, there's no doubt about it. Now the question is, can you build yourself up into something that's strong enough to lift that without, without complaint and without corruption? Well, that's a noble goal. That's the goal of real education. That's what young people should be doing. They should have an, a conception of who they could be. And that conception should be something like, if I could be like that, everything would be worthwhile. That's what you want to aim at, because you want to make everything worthwhile. And so, so do it. You know, look, your situation's a good one. I mean, you had enough uh, courage to speak up at the free speech rally, which has become rather famous 
you know, interestingly enough, who would have predicted that, right? It's, it's, it's not, it wasn't obvious, but you got a career out of it instantly. Well, that's a lesson, man. You know, I listened to your speech, it was pretty damn clear, and, and you did a good job, and people noticed. And it, that's, that's the case. If you stand up and do something correctly, people who care about that sort of thing will notice. They will notice, and they will open doors for you. That's how the world works. Well, you'll open doors for yourself, for that matter, but, but don't underestimate the utility of, of proper action. It's, there isn't anything more powerful. There's nothing more powerful than, 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 than proper speech. And that's the speech that's rooted in your being and that is as clear and truthful as you can make it. There isn't anything more powerful than that. Maybe death isn't even more powerful than that. So. All right, we're going to end off on a quite a positive note, I think. <laughs> Jordan Peterson, I'm Jay Faze with Dot Media. Thank you for this interview. Thank you for talking to us. No problem. Have a nice day. Thanks for the opportunity. <laughs> if you enjoyed the video, like and subscribe to Rebel.media.